What's up guys? It's time for a live at five. I figured out that that rhymes and so now I'm just gonna call it live at five, live at five, live at five. But I'm gonna wait for you guys to join because I know a few of you are joining. Hey there. I just was talking about how I'm gonna coin this, the live at five, because I, re I recognize that this rhymes and so now I can't stop thinking about it as anything else but live at five. So that's just me saying some dad jokes, but I am so excited that you're joining me. Um, this is just our time to kind of hang out and talk about wellness, get your questions answered. Um, you know, I point you in the right direction. As I have to say now, um, as a disclaimer, this is not medical advice that's in this live, and you guys know that. I just have to say that for legal reasons, but this is all education and inspiration, and I really encourage you, you know, once I give you something to go look into, to go look into it yourself because really you know as the old philosophers would say is that experimentation is really the only way that you know you actually end up getting knowledge is trying it for yourself and you know all these people that say oh there's not a research study to back it up and there's not this and this and this and I'm like really really you know you have to understand that when it comes to health and it comes to your own body you know what's best and you need to experiment in order to know what's best for your body and so i encourage you to do that and i encourage you to go and become your own health advocate and to try out different things on your body until you find what works for you and um the only way to do that is to experiment so I know that you guys are super into that, that you guys do that. That's what you're here for. You're here for, you're hungry for information. You're hungry for the, the right information. Obviously, what is mainstream is not working for us, right? And so we need to find alternatives. And there's so many people in the health and wellness world right now that are just regurgitating each other. Like I say this often, I'm like, you know, everyone just regurgitates what everyone else is talking about and they don't even really know why they're saying it or they don't really have a lot of evidence to back it up and it really bothers me but I have my first question coming in so here we go hi pretty lady coffee has been too acidic on my stomach lately what's your thought on matcha with unsweetened coconut milk you know it's super great if if coffee is too acidic for you that's really interesting that's something that should be maybe thought about that your your digestive system is irritated um because coffee this idea of acidic and alkalinity is just such bs it's so funny um that people are like this food is acidic and this food is alkaline and i'm like that makes no sense because on a like if you actually understand biochemistry we know that a food or a substance in itself right is either acid or alkaline but when it's combined with something else it can become acidic or alkaline, you know? And so the body very, very, very closely regulates acidity and alkalinity. And this idea that the body needs to be pH balanced is absolute BS because most areas in your body are slightly acidic or um, are made acidic by the body if they're too alkaline. So it's just like really funny. Um, but if, you know, if long story to say is make sure that your coffee is organic um it might be too strong and then if you're still having problems your digestive tract just might be need a break or need soothing which can um you can use aloe vera for that i really love aloe vera gel or you can just take an aloe leaf and scrape out the inside but matcha is a great is a great alternative and coconut milk is my favorite uh, non-dairy alternative so you guys know i'm not a huge fan of nut products um, i think they pose their own risk and so um, if you're gonna switch out something for non-dairy it should be coconut milk but yeah matcha is amazing it, it um, does have a slight amount of caffeine in it but it also has a lot of l-theanine which is very calming and grounding it's um you know an amino acid and a lot of people take it as a supplement for anxiety and so i think that's why a lot of people that get the jitters with coffee um seem to do really well on matcha or green tea because it does have l-theanine just um, I want you guys to remember that green tea and matcha is very high in fluoride content naturally. And so if you have thyroid issues or you're finding that you're developing hypothyroid symptoms like cold hands, cold feet, low temps, um, you're maybe seeing your hair get dry or fall out, remember fluoride is a thyroid suppressant and black tea and green tea are naturally high in fluoride. What's your thoughts on Ovacetol? Yeah, you guys, so I get this um, question all the time and I should just do a post on it so that you guys can like refer to it because so many people ask it, but I am a suit. 
a super, I was going to say such a huge fan and super huge fan, sorry. Um, I'm a super huge fan of myo-inositol or inositol, which is vitamin B8. Um, ovacetol, on the other hand, I, there's nothing against the product itself. Like the product itself is great. It's just myo-inositol and dechiro inositol in a ratio of 40 to 1. But the shoddy science that they use to promote that their supplement is the best is really hilarious to me. Like they charge double for their product based on this shoddy idea that in the ovaries you have a, a ratio of 40 to 1 of myo-inositol to d inositol but there's no evidence that taking it in that form does anything for your body. So I mean if you want to take it and it makes you feel better about the supplementation by all means go for it. Um, I do recommend if people are on Ovacetol to just try out my Inositol for no other reason than to just save yourself 40 bucks. And then if it doesn't work as well as Ovacetol, you can go back to Ovacetol. But if it does, then you just save yourself 40 bucks every time you go to buy it. So I like Pure Encapsulations brand Myo Inositol, which you can find on Amazon. Um, and in my opinion, it works just as, just as well as Ovacetol. Like, secrets out. Hey Jess, please do stories on the best way to exercise for PCOS and also is dizziness a symptom of insulin resistance? Dizziness is, can sometimes be a symptom of thyroid issues or um, low or high progesterone, just depending. It can also be a symptom of cortisol issues. Um, usually dizziness is caused by your blood sugar dramatically dropping very quickly. So hypoglycemia, but that can be affected by your hormones. So when you're dizzy, ask yourself, did you eat recently? Um, if you have gone maybe two or three hours without eating, you might be dropping into a hypoglycemic state. Um, if you are getting really dizzy after exercise, you know, that could be the case that you are, you know, your body burned through all that fuel and now you have are in a hypoglycemic state. And that's not a state we want to be in, you guys, because remember, when our body drops into a hypoglycemic state, equal meaning that we don't have enough sugar, our stress hormones have to rise in order for the tissues like your thymus gland, your muscle tissue, your skin tissue to be broken down, sent to the liver to be turned into glucose to keep blood sugar levels stable. So this is why we need to make sure we're always practicing blood sugar balance because if we're not and we go hypoglycemic, stress hormones rise. Um, and then, you know, I will do more stories on the best way to exercise for PCOS, but this is really different for everybody, you guys, because PCOS is such a broad term. Everyone's so like struggling with such different um, issues. I do recommend that if you are in a really high stress state, meaning you're really metabolically damaged, you need to really take it easy because you need to think of exercise as this, you guys. You're breaking down tissue and you have to rebuild that tissue. There's, it's an inflammatory process and it's also an energy intensive process process. So if you're metabolically damaged or you're not eating enough fuel or you're not taking in the proper nutrients or you're nutrient deficient, you have no business to be breaking down tissue because your body cannot properly build it back up. And that just creates more stress and more imbalances and more depletion. Does that make sense? So it really depends on the metabolic state you're in. If you're in a really bad place, um, you probably shouldn't be exercising. Um, exercising and movement are two different things. You're allowed to walk around, have an active job, you know, ride a bicycle, just kind of relax, but move your body. But then, you know, exercise, specifically intensive exercise, that's a different thing than movement. You know, I, I encourage my women to move and walk and, you know, be active. But when it comes to exercise and actually building down and breaking down muscle and rebuilding it, 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 it just takes a little bit more of a responsibility. And I don't really recommend people that aren't metabolically stable to really start to take on you know huge exercise routines but I will um, talk about my take on exercise and how I kind of uh, design myself a routine I just designed myself one a couple days ago because I haven't <laughs> worked out in like a month um, just because of like being stressed and just um, being busy and I this, that is not normal for me I used to be in the gym like every day six days a week like that was just my my routine for six years and uh, starting a business has really <laughs> uh, put me through a loop but I I'm back on it and I'm a huge fan of functional training, um, high intensity interval training and strength training. So um, I'll kind of show you guys, I'll walk you through on a story one day of how I go and design myself a program. But remember women, we love to like take more than we can handle. It's really important to just start with the basics to really gradually increase your exercise level until you're exercising maybe like 30 to 45 minutes, um, four to six days a week, just depending on how well your body can handle exercise. What are some natural ways to lower testosterone, allergy to soy? So you guys, I want you to remember that 
even though so many people say PCOS is an androgen issue, you need to remember that high androgens is in a response to something. Testosterone and DHEA are both very powerful substances that your body usually uses to protect the tissues from stress. So isn't that funny that the body protects itself with testosterone and DHEA, which are specifically very high in your tissues like your brain, your heart, and your lungs, and which makes those organs very resilient to stress? And in PCOS, we have high androgens. So is androgens the problem or is androgens a response to the problem? I personally see that um, lowering androgens in women just comes with its own side effects. Lowering androgens, the androgens are not the issue. The androgens are a response to high levels of estrogen in the tissues and high levels of stress. So if you really want your androgen levels to lower and you want your testosterone to lower, you need to focus on blood sugar balance. You need to focus on um, lowering stress levels, both internal and external, and you need to make sure you're detoxing estrogens properly. Part of that is having enough progesterone being made when you ovulate and having enough progesterone in your body, which helps mobilize estrogen from the tissues and helps them detoxify via the liver. Now remember, the liver is a cornerstone of stress. So if you have a very low functioning liver or a very stagnant liver, your body cannot metabolize hormones properly. And so it will just go back into circulation. There's almost like a simplifying it, there's a trap door in the liver. So when, you're, when your liver is really backed up or not efficient, things will drop out of the trap door, go back into circulation, be either stored in the fat cells, stored in the tissues, stored in the thyroid, um, and will not get out of the body properly. So I very regularly see high testosterone being an inflammation issue, a high cortisol issue, a high stress issue, a high estrogen issue, and has really nothing to do with testosterone itself. I hope that makes sense. Um, but I like L-theanine for lowering stress. That's a really good supplement for lowering stress, but it's really a whole system issue. That's why I like sometimes when people ask me a simple question, it ends up being a complicated answer because it's not as simple as just, I need to lower testosterone. It's like, there's a reason why testosterone is high and you need to get to the root cause of why that's high um, to get the testosterone to lower. But the testosterone is actually very protective for your reproductive organs. As much as we hate that it causes, um, you know, our hair to grow, but I find that actually women a lot of times get hair loss and hirsutism when testosterone is quote unquote in the normal range. And it's because prolactin is high and the, and the thyroid is not functioning properly and so I have a feeling that the reason why like blocking DHT and all these things that people are doing to like stop their hair from falling out or stop hirsutism it's be the reason those things aren't working is not because those things don't work or the testosterone's too powerful it's because the testosterone is not what's causing the issue. You know what I mean? It's thyroid issues, it's high prolactin, um, and those things also cause hirsutism, also cause hair loss, um, also cause acne. So um, we, have to, uh, we have to ask ourselves, is testosterone a response to the issue or is it the issue? And I think it's a response to the issue because all these people that are saying, oh, it's testosterone, you need to lower testosterone. And you know, I have women coming to me, I get really, really complicated cases. Like people have gone to five different nutritionists and five different functional doctors before they come to me. And so like, they've already tried androgen blockers. Like they're like, dude, <laughs> I'm schooled on androgen blockers and they're not working for me. And so this is what makes me have to dig really deep because I just have been blessed. You know, you guys come to me and you are at the end of your rope and I'm like, I gotta figure this shit out. And so I do. And um, I'm starting to see that the research points to androgens being a response to the issue. I started doing a protein, fat, and healthy carb each meal. A lot less cravings for bad sweets. Thank you. You're welcome. Because guess what, you guys? Your body is super wise, and it needs carbs. Your, your cells prefer to burn on glucose. And when you don't eat carbs, you don't eat sugar, guess what happens? <laughs> your body's going to crave those things. Cravings are just a compass to tell you what nutrients you're deficient in or what your body needs. Cravings are not bad. You're not a bad girl. Your body just is like, dude, I get sugar from sweets, and so I'm going to crave them. That's, that's what it's at. <laughs> Can you talk about coffee a little bit? There are so many conflicting views on coffee and caffeine and endo issues. Honestly, you guys, I keep my advice very simple. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work. If it does, you don't feel a problem with it, stop making a problem out of something that's not a problem. Like, it's simple. And, you know, remember before the age of Instagram and Google and all this stuff, you just didn't eat things that made you feel bad and you consume things that you did. People have been consuming caffeine and coffee for thousands of years. It's been known to be, I shouldn't say thousands, I meant hundreds. Like, I don't know if that's scientifically accurate. <laughs> um, hundreds of years. And it's very, um, 
it's protect it's known to be protective you guys it's known to be protective of the liver there are so many research studies showing that people that drink coffee live longer and are better off metabolically than people that don't um, caffeine and coffee in general is pro thyroid pro metabolism if you actually take your temperature after you drink a, gla um, a cup of coffee your your temperature will heat up a lot of people say that caffeine directly secretes cortisol this is untrue um, the reason that some people do get high cortisol when they drink caffeine is not because caffeine directly spikes cortisol. It's because of what I just said. When you, um, when your metabolism is functioning very quickly, you have high needs for sugar. You have about a, you, uh, you know, about 150 grams per day of sugar. You, your body has to burn, will burn through sugar. So when you drink caffeine, it increases your metabolic rate. You're burning through sugar a lot quicker. When you burn through that sugar, when your liver's done, your liver's like, no more sugar guys, we need more sugar. Like I said before, Stress hormones have to rise. It is the only way that your body can make its own sugar is actually raising cortisol and adrenaline. The specific tasks of stress hormones, and I have never heard somebody say this and I'm like, why? The specific tasks of stress hormones is to break down your tissues in order to send those tissues to the liver to be converted into glucose to keep blood sugar levels stable. This is why when people are in low carb diets or not eating enough carbohydrates or sugar, they are anxious, they have stress, they have high cortisol levels very regularly, and they feel jittery when they drink caffeine because there's no sugar to mitigate the effects. Remember, sugar is adaptogenic you guys it's the og adaptogen and if we do not have enough in our body our body has to make it make it there is no such thing as my body prefers to burn fat for fuel your body will burn fat for fuel as a as a necessity if it's if it's forced to do so but that doesn't mean it, it prefers to burn fat for fuel it will do anything it can to burn glucose for fuel because it's a more metabolically stable thing to burn okay so coffee I should have, that was a long story for coffee is usually very protective of the liver. It's very rich in certain B vitamins, specifically niacinamide and caffeine is metabolically enhancing. So um, I, that's why it's really good to actually put a little sugar in your coffee, like coconut sugar or raw honey, or um, even, you know, organic sugar, like heaven forbid, um, and a little bit of fat. It will help kind of mitigate the jitteriness of coffee. But if you can tolerate it, great. Um, some people do find that it kind of, um, increases their jitteriness or their anxiety but I always say is that a caffeine issue or is that a fact that the liver is really unstable and can't really um, handle the the speeding up of the metabolism <clears throat> Hi, I have a terrible pain around ovulation. Like I feel like I need to hold my ovaries up because they are so heavy. I do know that I'm very low progesterone working on overall balance work in my life. Yes, so sometimes around ovulation, you guys, um, inflammation plays a huge role in ovulation pain. And so I find that uh, making sure you're really supporting the gut during that time to keep the gut really um, soothed, I, I guess you could say, can actually be very, very helpful. I find that women that are maybe chronically constipated or are eating kind of irritating foods around that time tend to see their ovulation pain increase. I also see women who are very estrogen dominant or have, I hate the word estrogen dominant because it's not really the proper term. It's more like you have too much estrogen in relationship to testosterone or to progesterone. Um, you you can tend to get a lot of inflammation because remember, you guys, estrogen is inflammatory. Period. It has always been known that estrogen is inflammatory. It used to be called adipin. It used to be known that estrogen, when given to cows, would fatten them up a lot quicker, so they could be slaughtered a lot quicker. Then the pharmaceutical companies had to come in and say. Um, you know, we have to change uh, adipin to the word estrogen, and then that's when estrogen was born and started to be called the female hormone and all that kind of stuff. So pretty much, um, it's just that too much estrogen is inflammatory and you need a lot of progesterone in order to balance that out. So you want to really be focusing uh, on inflammation during that time. I really love castor oil packs for that reason. Um, I also um, really like magnesium for that reason. Um, eating a carrot every single day about a week before you ovulate can be very helpful, like a medium carrot. Um, 
and making sure you're getting enough fruit to kind of lower stress hormones. So, you know, overall, it's really about making sure you're making enough progesterone in relationship to estrogen and also lowering inflammation in the gut, making sure everything's moving, making sure you're having a bowel movement daily, all of that kind of stuff. What is your take on CBD and using it for sleep? Yeah, so CBD, you guys, is kind of like a new, it's pretty new. Um, it's this new phenomenon, and it's being promised as like, you know, the end-all, be-all. And we do have endocannabinoid receptors throughout the body, meaning that we have receptors that respond specifically to CBD or cannabinoids. Um, and it can be, you know, it can be very supportive to some people. Like some people really see a very huge reduction in stress when they take CBD. They feel really relaxed and all of that stuff. So, you know, there's still emerging research. We do know that there is some evidence that points to marijuana itself being um, slightly estrogenic, um, but uh, that's not, doesn't necessarily mean that's the case with CBD, but there's not enough uh, research to know. So if it helps you, I'm pro. Um, if it doesn't, like it can get expensive. So it's kind of like on a case by case basis. If you like it and it helps you, by all means do it. But I also say with things like this, it's like you have to get to the root cause of why you're not sleeping well. Um, if you're not making enough progesterone, CBD won't really fix that. Um, it might lower inflammation a little bit, which can help you. But again, remember you guys, if you're struggling with symptoms, symptoms are the way the body speaks to you. And you need to ask yourself why something is happening and not just say, how can I fix this? Because that doesn't get to the root cause as to why something is happening in the first place. Thoughts on taking valerian root occasionally for sleep. I love it. Um, I actually, um, when my clients have a hard time sleeping, I recommend them use the Nighty Night Tea by Traditional Medicinals that has valerian added, and it can really be helpful for sleep. Um, you can also add a coconut, a, a coconut oil, a tablespoon of coconut oil to that, and a little bit of raw honey, which really supports blood sugar balance all night long, which can help you sleep really well. Thoughts on TRS? Um, uh, oh, TRS. So TRS is like a detox sim system, I believe. Um, you know, I think it, I'm not super familiar with it. I know that it's a, like they say, like their purport, like it's like a heavy metal detox. I wish I could like Google it right now to see what ingredients are in it. But Honestly, you guys, it's so expensive. I think it is. And anything that's like promising, like you have heavy metals in your body, you have to be very careful with heavy metal detoxes. This is a very big buzzword, and I don't think people understand the dangers of freeing heavy metals and getting them into your system. You need to make sure your liver is on point before you do any kind of intense detox protocol like a heavy is specifically a heavy metal detox because if not you guys then your body has to take that hit and heavy metals can cross the blood brain barrier and cause permanent brain damage and so when you start your body's very wise and knows exactly what needs to happen when it's exposed to a heavy metals it, or a heavy metal it usually stores it in a fat tissue or um, a tissue and it keeps it safe and kind of protected from the rest of the body. But when you start to take things like chelators that mobilize heavy metals, you can't control where those things end up. You're, you're hoping that they get out of the body, but unless your liver is optimized and you're having regular bowel movements and your detox pathways are open, that can end up working against you and those heavy metals can be exposed to tissues that your body didn't want those heavy metals to to um come in contact with so with any of these detoxes you guys i just really recommend you understand that your liver <laughs> relies upon four things to be detoxing properly saturated fat salt amino acids, 100 grams a day, and sugar. And it needs those four things to detox optimally. If it doesn't have those things, no amount of detoxes are going to do anything for you except maybe harm you. Um, so I, I've, I personally don't have a lot of experience with TRS, but anything that like seems scammy or promises are too good to be true or is really expensive in comparison to the, like buying the individual ingredients um, should kind of be a red flag in your head. I missed your comment on green tea. Is it good for thyroid and PCOS or not? So a lot of people will say that PCOS, it suppresses um, 
t testosterone and androgens but like I said uh, green tea leaves and black tea leaves are actually very rich in fluoride which um, consumed too often and too much can suppress thyroid function because we know fluoride suppresses thyroid function so um, if you're already drinking like fluoridated water and then you're also um, doing green tea all the time it can suppress thyroid function slightly but that's it's different for everybody like I'm not saying that's like a blanket deal but it can be sorry I gotta get a sip of water I'm talking too much okay what are some reasons for your celiac panel to be off the charts for years even associated with low vitamin D and B12 and then after four years of gluten-free life it's back to normal but still low vitamin levels um I'm not sure uh necessarily but I can give you like a perspective um so when you consume gluten and you are like continually consuming it and you take a blood test and your body is reacting to it there's going to be a lot of evidence that your body is reacting right like there's, there's going to be tons of antibodies tons of evidence that your body's uh, attacking or reacting but then if you're gluten free really you know you're not consuming any gluten for four years that's a very long time your body's not reacting to gluten anymore right it's not attacking gluten because it, it doesn't need to you're not consuming it and so a lot of times when you don't eat gluten regularly um, for a long period of time, your body, the stress response to gluten goes down, right? Because you're not consuming it. And so it might not show up on a blood test, but that doesn't mean that you are, or uh, a biopsy, um, but that doesn't mean that you are, you know, healed. It just means that you are not reacting to it because you haven't been consuming it. Now go back to consuming it and then take the test and see where you're at. That is really a better perspective as to uh, if your body's still reacting to it. Now, I'm not recommending you consume gluten if you have celiac disease. I'm just saying that that would be a better picture as to how your body is actually responding in reality. Now, vitamin levels are a completely different scenario. Vitamin D, remember, is a hormone that's made by the sun, um, and it can be low in response to a lot of stressors. So is vitamin D a root cause problem, or is it a response to a problem? And I think it's a response to a problem because... Um, it doesn't make sense like if somebody's taking a lot of vitamin D supplements or getting a lot of sunlight and they're still getting having low vitamin D, it's usually a response to something else. Um, so it's best to get vitamin D from the sun. And then um, if you have low B12, this can be due to a lot of different reasons. Um, it can be due to the fact that you're not metabolizing B vitamins very well, your stomach acid is low and so you're not getting it from um, your um, food very well. Um, it can be because your liver is really stressed out and going through B12 very quickly. Like B12 has a purpose and if you're utilizing it very, very much or a lot, then um, you could constantly be deficient in it. So um, there are a lot of different <laughs> scenarios when it comes to vitamin deficiencies. Um, there are so many hormones that affect how your body holds on to nutrients and utilizes nutrients and so you know it, it's hard for me to say but um, there could be some reasons for sure and it doesn't necessarily have to do with small intestine absorption it could have something to do with low stomach acid um, you're not getting enough sunlight you know it can have you know there could be so many different factors involved also no small intestine damage on biopsy when celiac panel was high okay so yeah I mean like if you don't have any small intestine damage, then I don't know why the vitamins are low. That's really interesting, but it could be because of low stomach acid. <clears throat> My testosterone has been high for over eight years. Yeah, so like I said, an androgen response. Um, think about it. If you're trying to lower testosterone, your body's fighting you, maybe there's a reason as to why it's high. That's always a question that needs to be asked is whenever something, I find that like a lot of health and wellness practitioners, doctors, like just a lot of people in general are always asking the wrong question. It's not, how do I lower my testosterone? That's not gonna get you anywhere. The question is, why is my testosterone high? That's the question that needs to be answered and that's really the root cause fix is when you ask the right question or why something is high, you can actually go to the solution to the answer because in that question, there's a solution. Best tips to liver cleanse. Um, liver cleanses don't have to be done, you guys. Um, you do want to support your liver with, so you wanna make sure you're getting 100 grams of uh, bioavailable amino acids per day. So I'm, I'm talking to you vegans and vegetarians. Um, plants are not bioavailable sources of protein, I'm sorry. I just hate to break it to you. But if you're trying to actually get optimal metabolic function and liver function, you do need a wide variety of animal foods. Now, I'm not actually a, a proponent of a heavy meat diet. Um, people are like, when I say, you know, plant 
plant-based proteins are not a bioavailable source, people freak out and they're like, I don't want to eat a meat heavy diet. And I'm like, I don't want to eat a meat heavy diet either. Um, I recommend getting a lot of protein from gelatinous sources and then taking a nose to tail perspective when it comes to meat. So broths, collag collagenous or gelatinous foods, um, you know, we have a wonderful modern society where you can literally buy powdered collagen and gelatin and utilize that in your daily life. Um, you know, to make sure you're getting grass-fed beef organs. We, again, live in a modern society where you can take those in a supplement form. Um, and you're also getting uh, food from eggs or protein from eggs. And then you're also getting protein from dairy if you can tolerate it because that is actually a very bioavailable and easy to absorb protein. Casein protein specifically is um, very relaxing and anti-stress, so it can really lower cortisol levels. So I find that when women can tolerate dairy, it can be a very effective strategy, adaptogenic almost in nature. It helps you adapt to stress very quickly. So, you know, I really recommend first focusing on protein when it comes to liver cleansing. Your, your liver cannot function without enough protein, period. I don't care how much milk thistle you consume or how many coffee enemas you do, your liver's like, dude, I need protein. That's the first thing. The second thing is sugar. So um, people on low carb diets have a lot lower liver function than somebody that's eating enough sugar for their body. Specifically fructose from fruit is very supportive to the liver. The next thing is you more, really wanna avoid polyunsaturated fats, specifically the ones from industrial seed oils like canola oil and soybean oil and um, you know the nasty oils, but also in, in higher amounts like or in lower amounts, like if you're doing lots and lots of nuts or you're doing like lots and lots of um, uh, grains, which both also have polyunsaturated fats in lower amounts, that is very damaging to the liver. The liver gets damaged by polyunsaturated fats. That's actually, um, you know, there is evidence that that plays a role in fatty liver disease. So you really wanna put, place an emphasis on saturated fats. Coconut oil, grass-fed butter, ghee, MCT oil, and small amounts of beef tallow, and then just making sure you're getting your uh, uh, other fats from your meats. But really, um, saturated fats are healing to the liver, whereas polyunsaturated fats are damaging to the liver. And those are the main foundational things that you'd wanna do to really support your liver. And then like, I sometimes use a supplement called Liver Rescue by Health Force, which is like milk thistle, turmeric, like the general herbs that are liver detoxifying. Chlorophyll added to your water is very liver supportive. And then um, I also like a, a supplement called SAT by Thorne, which you can get on Amazon. And that is um, the, I guess, like certain compounds that are found in milk thistle, turmeric, that kind of, um, and I I believe Jerusalem artichoke, artichoke, sorry. Hey Jess, I just read that having yeast infections is linked to Hashimoto's disease. Is that true? Yes, you guys. So suppressed thyroid function equals more infections in the body, more allergies, blah, 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 suppressed immune system. Your thyroid is a regulator of your immune system because it's a regulator of your metabolism and your metabolism regulates how you respond to stressors. So yes, absolutely. Any kind of thyroid condition will equal more food allergies, more food sensitivities. That's why we get a lot of allergies in the spring because you know, uh, long, shorter days and not enough light does really put us into almost like a slight hypothyroid state, which coming out of uh, winter, if we're turning into spring, we're getting more longer light. Our thyroid function starts to increase and but during that time, we're really sensitive to allergens, pollens, things like that. So yes, thyroid function absolutely affects how your body responds to attacks, including that of yeast and candida um, and funguses. So um, I find that so many people with Hashimoto's have yeast overgrowth already in their guts. And then a lot of times people on Hashimoto's are trying to do like low sugar diets or they were told like a paleo diet or an autoimmune paleo diet is like the best thing for them or they're on a keto diet. And guess what, you guys? We, um, yeast is a very opportunistic, uh, back, or not bacteria, but it's a very opportunistic organism. And so when it gets starved, it gets crazy. It doesn't die. Like people are like, oh, I'm starving my candida. I'm like, no, you're not. You are making it vicious and you are making it angry. And when you starve candida, it has these finger-like projections that start going through your cell walls and start getting outside of the gut and can become systemic. And that's when it gets into 
the um the vaginal canal it can get on the skin it can get into the sinuses um that is that that actually can sometimes make it angrier starving it so um if you have an overgrowth of yeast you can absolutely get a lot of yeast infections um, many people with autoimmune diseases have a lot of gut issues um and so that could be why it's it's related but yeah that's very interesting i'm glad they're starting to see that yeah they're interrelated for sure um, I just had a small cyst pop up on my shoulder and my doctor prescribed me an antibiotic. Do you think an antibiotic is necessary? Yeah, I'm really not sure. You should probably listen to your doctor on that. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, if it's like a small antibiotic cream, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, sometimes it doesn't help the cyst, but if it does, like that's great. Um, some people like to use castor oil packs on cysts and I find that they work really, really well. So if you're like, I want a more natural option, you can always try something before you try the antibiotic cream, but I would recommend listening to the doctor, um, specifically if the cyst is getting worse and, and that kind of thing. But some other alternatives are like MSM cream, um, which is like a sulfur uh, precursor. Um, you can do like tea tree oil as antibacterial and antifungal. Like I used to, when I get, I used to get um, a cyst as well on my back and I used to like try everything I could possibly do before I took the antibiotic cream. Um, but eventually I just used the antibiotic cream to get it completely gone. Like I found that tea tree oil and apple cider vinegar and all those natural antibacterials did um, help like bring it down. But the only thing that really like truly got rid of it was the antibiotic cream. So um, I didn't have to use as much because I used a lot of like natural antibiotics. Um, I also use colloidal silver. That's another one. Um, but I do, um, you know, when it comes to things like that, like small little weird things, um, listening to your doctor is a good idea. <laughs> I told my dentist the other day for a teeth cleaning and I started oil pulling and he said the coconut oil will destroy my teeth. My teeth feel whiter and stronger since doing it. Why would the coconut oil destroy your teeth? Whack. Yeah, I don't really understand. Um, I usually don't tell like any conventional dentists or doctors like certain things I'm doing because they just like are like, they get angry about it almost like defensive. And I'm like, that's so weird. Like it's my body, <laughs> like what? Um, I coconut oil pull every day, you guys. My teeth have never been better. Obviously my teeth are really white. I don't do anything really for them except for coconut oil pull. So I find that the same thing, that it makes my teeth whiter, stronger, and um, I don't have any bad breath. Like I don't even wake up with bad breath. So it's just like, I find the only benefit from it, but maybe he has some information that I don't have. I don't know. You should have asked him, well, can you give me a, like a reason why that would happen? And he'd be like, uh, 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 you know, cause that's what happens. <laughs> Hi Jessica, before I had my daughter, I barely ever sweated. And since I've had her, it's like she turned on a furnace inside of me and I sweat now. Any tips on controlling sweat naturally? So the first thing is, you guys, when you don't sweat, that is a huge red flag that you're metabolically unstable. Um, if you can't sweat, that is usually a sign that you have a lot of, you're under a lot of stress. Your body's trying to retain as much nutrients and as much minerals and as much hydration as possible. So the fact that you're sweating is a good is a good thing. Obviously, excessive sweating is not a good thing. So are you under stress? Do you have low progesterone? Um, are you sleeping enough? Are you being exposed to lots of LED or fluorescent lighting? All of those things are very stressful. And so they can, you know, sometimes stress can cause excessive sweating. Um, it's a good idea. Like if you haven't gotten checked by your doctor recently or asked him about it, you should. Um, because sometimes they'll want to run certain tests on you just to make sure it's not like Cushing's disease or those kinds of things. So it is important to talk to your doctor about excessive sweating. Um, if you've already gotten it checked out and there's nothing wrong, like sometimes it can be thyroid issues. I mean, it could be so many different things. Also, remember that the sweat response is the body's response to getting toxins out. So I find a lot of people that are like super sweaty, specifically in their armpits, like your body is trying to, to rid itself of toxins and it can't do it quick enough. Specifically, like remember you guys, you have lymph nodes that kind of sit underneath your, near your breasts. And so your body's super wise. Like your body's really trying to protect you almost all the time and um i find that a lot of people that have you know excessive sweat are also trying to detox your you know they have a lot of um toxic overload so making sure you're supporting your liver is really helpful making sure you get your hormones checked and you kind of know where your hormones are at um, and maybe, uh, you can also check your prolactin levels. Anytime you have a baby and you're having like excessive stress, uh, type symptoms, it's really important to get your prolactin levels checked. 
I have dysbiosis and I'm keto, trying to transition to a more gut health friendly, and I hear you mention eating sugar. I'm incorporating more resistant starch, but what do you mean by sugar? So um, remember when you transition out of keto, you're technically insulin resistant. Um, when you go keto, you put yourself into like almost a hibernation state, and just like a bear that goes into hibernation, once they come out of hibernation, they are insulin resistant for about usually like a month um, and they just continue to eat lots and lots of sugar until their body kind of regulates. So remember that starches affect your uh, your uh, metabolism the most because you have to think of it this way, you guys. Um, starch is usually pure glucose and glucose gets absorbed directly from the digestive tract into the bloodstream, which immediately raises blood sugar levels. Whereas fructose and sucrose get sent to the liver first, which fills glycogen stores and remember your liver is like a battery pack for the body. It stores lots and lots of sugar in the liver to keep the cells fueled under stress. So, you know, you, when you're coming out of keto, the best possible sources of, of carbohydrate is fruit because you're sending that fructose gets sent to the liver, which will store it up. Well, it will send a lot of, um, glucose or in the form of glycogen to store in the muscles. Um, but when you're eating pure starch, you're actually absorbing, like it's spiking blood sugar. So I recommend when you're coming out of keto, or transitioning off of keto to really track your blood sugar very carefully and to really watch how certain foods, specifically carbs, affect your body. So you're going to find that um, either starch or fruit spikes your blood sugar. A lot of times fruit doesn't and you actually see that starch does. So this is different for every single person. That's why I recommend having a blood, glu uh, a blood glucose uh, monitor so you can actually kind of track to see um, how that affects your body. Um, and then, you know, sugar, you guys, like honey is fructose. Maple syrup is fructose. And I find that a lot of people that have been on keto are very afraid of carbs. Like it's almost like, like you have to understand, you guys, that there is a slight uh, disordered eating there when you are afraid of carbs or you're afraid of sugar. Um, a fear of a food is not a good thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, if I understand that coming off of keto can be a very psychologically scary thing um, and it's okay to also seek help, but it's very important to experiment with all types of sugar. Remember, different carbs are going to uh, affect your blood sugar differently. So specifically like very concentrated sources of, sh of sugar, like organic cane sugar, coconut sugar, date syrup, maple syrup, honey, those are um, usually more metabolically stable as well as fruits. I like fruits better than pure sugar just because, you know, you're getting a lot of minerals, you're getting fiber, that kind of thing. Usually those are tend to be better than starch when you're first transitioning off of a keto diet, but you're just going to have to experiment and track your blood sugar and see um, how those all affect. And remember, you need to still be eating enough saturated fats and enough protein to keep blood sugar levels stable. So the be uh, somebody says the best ways to lower estrogen. Yes, the best ways to lower estrogen, you guys, is to make sure you have enough progesterone. That is the first thing <laughs> that you should be doing. Um, the second thing is to make sure your liver is functioning optimally. So your body is forced to store estrogen in the tissues. If it cannot, your body wants to break down estrogen in the liver and send it to either the, the poop or the pee. So your body, that's how your body gets rid of estrogen. And when it can't do that, like when the liver is not metabolizing things very efficiently or well, the body has to put it somewhere where it's gonna be safe. And so usually that's the fat cells. And so um, that's where our bodies like to store hormones and toxins and that kind of thing. So um, the best way to lower estrogen is slowly um, and to take very like anti-estrogen um, type of food. So you really wanna be able to um, supporting detox. Carrots are very anti-estrogenic and really help bind to estrogens in the gut and support gut detox. Uh, sweet potatoes are really important as well. Um, amino acids are very important, like I just said, supporting the liver. So remember the four foundational things for the body. Sugar, um, protein, saturated fat, and salt are very foundational for the liver for detoxification. And then, you know, just general liver support. So chlorophyll in your water, you could do like liver rescue. Um, uh, SAT is really helpful from Thorn. Like I, those are what I use personally. Um, and then I just make sure I'm eating enough specifically uh, um, like starchy root fibers and fruits. Uh, those fibers are very gentle on the digestive tract, but also bind to estrogen to carry it out.
out of the body. And then you also have to make sure you're having bowel movement every day. Like you've got to be getting that stuff out very quickly. So those are kind of my main, like the main goals. Um, vitamin E can also be very therapeutic and helping you detox estrogen. You need to be careful with it though. So it can be very powerful and some people actually take it and they'll get like really bad headaches, migraines, rashes, and it's not because vitamin E is bad, it's just because vitamin E is doing what it's supposed to do. So, um, you know, I would go really slow if you're going to do vitamin E. Vitamin K is also anti-estrogenic and a lot of people are deficient. Um, vitamin A is very anti-estrogenic, but I recommend getting it from um, grass-fed beef liver. Um, or raw dairy products like raw cheese um, and not like supplementing vitamin A just because it can store up in the tissues very quickly. Um, but yeah, so the fat soluble vitamins are very helpful. Um, minerals like magnesium and calcium, you know, just general overall body support. When we start focusing on detoxing something, we really need to focus on overall whole body balance and our body really does the detox work itself. Our body totally knows how to detox. It just needs the right tools to do so. Um, I don't know if you've answered this before, but what are your thoughts on soy? Um, it's anti-thyroid and I, to me, it's like I avoid it like the plague. If you want a high functioning metabolism, um, you do not want to be eating tons of soy. <laughs> Love, the, love these lives. Thank you for your time. Of course, you guys. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. I love these lives too. Hey, girl, I hear you on keto not being the greatest way to eat for the gut, but it is the only way I've been able to lose weight. Any suggestions why paleo isn't so effective for fat loss? So I want you guys to understand that the reason why keto can be really effective at losing weight is because, hold on. This is going to be long. Um, so... I'm trying to explain this in a way that doesn't, I, I don't think that keto is necessarily bad, but you do have to understand what's happening. So over time, as your metabolism becomes more and more damaged, your body t um, cannot process glucose as efficiently any longer. This can happen for multiple reasons, low thyroid function, too much estrogen in our environment, too many toxins, our liver's not functioning properly, blah, 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 blah. Normally people go to a diet like paleo or keto because they are messed up. They're not like going because they're like, oh, I want to be more healthy. Usually you're in a really bad state when you start a diet like that. And so you have to understand your metabolism is impaired and your body is probably preferring to burn fatty acids over glucose. Does that mean burning fatty acids is a better situation? No. Burning fatty acids is very metabolically dirty, meaning that it does uh, result in a lot of free radicals that your body has to break down. Your body has to protect itself. It can be inflammatory. Like it really can. But on the other hand, if your body's already preferentially burning fat for fuel over glucose, then it can seem like you're finally feeling better. Like, oh, I finally am burn losing weight. And but in keto, you have to be in a hypoglycemic state. You have to drop into hypoglycemia in order to get into ketosis. And the problem with that is, you guys, remember, the cells, specifically the brain cells, run on glucose. So if you're not consuming it, your body's making it. And how does your body make glucose? Your body raises stress hormones to break down tissues, send them to the liver, which then makes glucose to raise blood sugar levels. Adrenaline is the first hormone slash neurotransmitter that gets secreted. Adrenaline is a quote unquote weight loss hormone. It can help you burn fat very quickly. You'll, but you're burning through your tissues, you guys. So when you, you, you talk, when we talk about weight loss, weight loss doesn't matter. Fat loss matters. So a lot of women who are on keto are losing weight, but they're breaking down muscle and skin and tendons and tissues, and they're not actually breaking down a lot of fat. Um, they might be breaking down some fat, but they're also breaking down a lot of tissues to keep the glucose levels stable. So this is where you have to really be careful. Are you becoming... Um, are you losing a lot of muscle and turning it into fat? Um, you could still be losing weight in that situation, but you actually could be gaining a lot of fat per, body fat percentage. Um, and some people are just so metabolically, um, like their body has already started to prefer fatty acids that keto can be therapeutic for some time. It's just the long-term, um, the long-term game that's important. If you start to see hormonal issues, irregular cycles, loss of cycle, your hair's getting dry and brittle, um, you're starting to get really bad gut issues, um, 
or like you eat a carb and now you're like your gut is just wrecked that's a sign that it's probably impaired um your gut and your metabolism over helped it uh, over helping it and um you know being keto on keto suppresses thyroid function period end of story it does and so um eventually that does catch up at some point in some people now it's just kind of um you know weight loss is a, a root cause or is an issue that has a root cause and um losing weight unnaturally or ineffectively or inefficiently can actually um be damaging long term so if you're using weight loss as a marker for health that's not always um, a great one but if your moods are great your digestion's great your sleep is great your hair's not falling out you uh, have a lot of energy you're not aggressive you're not angry you're not jumpy you don't have a lot of fear you're um, you don't have anxiety you're not depressed um, you react really well to stress all those things if all those things are good then the keto diet is working for you and there's no reason to not be on it. Um, but if all of those things are not good, then that might be an indicator that your hormones are in a not so great place. Does that make sense? Like I'm not anti keto. I just want your metabolism working awesome. And I want your hormones balanced because that's, what's going to really lead to long-term success. Does gluten-free also mean grain free? Well, you guys, so you have to understand about grains is like grains are quote unquote seeds of a plant and grain your um plants that's the future generation of that plant right and so the plant has a desire to make sure that its future generation is going to survive and so it puts a lot of phytates or plant chemicals or or plant pesticides in that seed in order to protect that seed at all costs because obviously it wants to survive it wants to carry on that plant and so the goal is for that grain to make it all the way through your digestive tract and come out on the other end and to also irritate you along the way so you do not consume it again because it does not want to be consumed plants are smart too you guys so you know if you're really trying to lower inflammation and you're really trying to um increase you know, uh, really try to increase your health. Um, everyone has a different tolerance for grains, but there are a lot of um, compounds in certain grains that can be very irritating and inflammatory. Um, so I do stick to the more, um, I guess, like very gentle grains like white rice and um, like oats, sprouted oats, but I do them very irregularly for that very reason is just they tend to be more irritating to the gut and for a reason. They have a, a biological purpose to do that. But again, like if you're avoiding grains, a lot of times you switch it out for nuts, which doing nuts in too high amounts can be problematic too. So I just recommend taking a moderate approach to both and not going crazy with either um, and really focusing getting your carbs from roots and fruits. Um, that's the main thing is like squashes, roots, and fruits are where it's at when it comes to getting carbohydrates and trying to limit the amount of grains that you consume altogether. OMG, I was watching your story and heard about your lives. So glad I didn't miss it. I'm so happy you're here. Hey, Jessica, is there a max dosage, max dosage for inositol? I've been doubling up my dosage and finally got my period. That's awesome. Um, I wouldn't really worry about it um, unless you're like massively consuming it. But a lot of people um, uh, remember that inositol is depleted under stress. And so, or vitamin B8. Inositol is just vitamin B8. Um, and that's depleted under stress. And so sometimes people are super severely deficient in inositol. And so that's why higher doses dosages can help. You probably won't have to take a high, high dosage for, for a very like long period of time. But if that's being therapeutic to you, I mean, is it better to you than like taking a medication or something? As long as it's not uh, harming you and if you want to ask your doctor about it, go, you know, you absolutely should. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't really see a problem with it uh, except for that long-term use of high doses of B vitamins can deplete you in other B vitamins because they do work synergistically together and are usually found together in nature as well. How much progesterone should I start with and do you have a great brand? Yeah, so I can't really tell you how much progesterone to start with because it's just very different for every single woman. I do recommend like when you start progesterone, if you decided to start progesterone, to just really start very small and be very conservative. And then you can always work your dose up. But if you start with like a big amount or the full dose, you really don't know if like, you know, sometimes people will react badly just because it's like a shock to the system. 
So I recommend like really slowly titrating up, being very conservative. Like I always say like half or a fourth um, or even an eighth and then you can always work up um, rather than like starting with a huge amount and then you end up being like, um, yeah, you just end up going too hard. Thoughts on Paleo Valley grass-fed organ complex. Would this replace a multivitamin? Um, so... I don't really know about their uh, organ complex. I use ancestral supplements, um, so I'm not really sure. I'm sure they are similar because a lot of the organ complexes are similar. Um, but yeah, I actually use ancest ancestral supplements uh, organ complex. I really like their organs. They have a wide variety of organs available, so I really like them. They're very committed to quality. Um, the owner is very, very committed, so... I really trust that brand and um it wouldn't necessarily replace a multivitamin but multivitamins in my opinion are not super um i don't know they're they're not like the best way to get a wide variety of nutrients i really like to use liver uh consumed once a week and then like a grass-fed beef organ complex and then a, a can of smoked oysters once per week can be a really al good alternative to a multi um, and then like taking specific nutrients depending on what your individual issues are but multivitamins like the problem with them is that you can never like if you really were going to create a pill that had everything that you needed in it it would be like the size of your head <laughs> so you know you your goal should be to get most of your nutrients from food um, and then to um, kind of supplement if necessary. Doctor recommended progesterone cream to wake up ovaries, but estrogen is still low. Have you seen this help? Any harm in using progesterone cream? Um, I love bioidentical progesterone. If a doctor prescribes it, I'm like, praise God. Um, so I personally take bioidentical progesterone. I take it orally, but um, progesterone cream works just as well. So it just kind of depends on the doctor what they prescribe, but. I personally have seen progesterone cream be very effective um, in kind of bringing on ovulation because here's the thing with your cycles is it's like it kind of works in this vicious cycle. When you're not making enough progesterone, then you har have a hard time ovulating the next cycle around. And then it, you know, cause it's affecting the thyroid, the progesterone stimulates thyroid. And so, you know, here you are low progesterone, you're not getting optimal thyroid function, which the thyroid is considered the third ovary. So that's affecting your whole, your whole ovary system. Um, it's going to affect your estrogen production, your testosterone production, your progesterone production. And it's kind of this vicious cycle. So sometimes like think of it as like throwing a wrench in the wheel. You're like, dude, something's got to give. And so you give your body progesterone, which is very anti-inflammatory, anti-androgenic. It's very, um, stress reducing. Like it's a very wonderful, hormone and your body's like whoa yay I can start like it gives it something to work with and so I find progesterone being a very non-invasive way to really optimize your metabolic function and your thyroid function and I very regularly see it bring on a bleed very quickly um, when doctors prescribe it to my clients so I think it's worth a try um, you know it's way better than doing like some kind of unnatural progestin like Provera um, so I, you know, if it was me, I would totally do it. Um, but, you know, obviously trust your gut in those situations. You know what's right. You know if you're at the end of your rope. You know if you um, are willing to try just about anything. And what's the worst that can happen? You can stop taking it, you know? So just kind of weigh your pros and cons and think of it in a realistic perspective. I think sometimes we start to really stress ourselves out. You know, as women, we're like overthinkers. Me specifically, I'm such an overthinker. And it's like, okay, take a step back. What's the worst thing that can happen? Okay, I could feel bad. Okay, I could stop it, you know? And it's like, oh, there you go. So, um, you know, I just recommend uh, thinking about it and then trusting your gut. <clears throat> How to find a doctor that will prescribe bioidentical progesterone? You know, it's just kind of a hit or miss situation. Um, I usually recommend, sorry, these white lines really bother me, you guys. Like, you know it, every live. Um, I recommend looking for a functional or anti-aging doctor uh, in your area. That's the first place to kind of start. Some doctors will prescribe something called Prometrium, which is bioidentical progesterone. Um, that would be the prescription name. So you just kind of have to ask your doctor about it. Um, there's no shame in asking. And then if they don't, if they're like, no, they shut you down, 
then, you know, go find someone like a functional medicine doctor or an anti-aging doctor or an integrative medicine doctor. But usually that's what you do. You go to Google and you just type in integrative medicine doctor, anti-aging doctor, functional doctor, and usually something will come up. Okay, guys, I've been alive for an hour, and you know how Instagram shuts me down after an hour, so um, I will go live again to finish up these questions because I see recommendations for PCOS with no cycle. I see, do you recommend proge progesterone cream only after ovulation to period? Um, and I don't have time to answer these questions. So um, I will go live for another like 20 minutes or so and finish answering the questions.